Hello YouTube, how is everyone doing? It's Professional here. Welcome back to my playthrough of Medal of Honor Rising Sun. On this part here, we have the final mission, Super Carrier Sabotage. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this series. It's a huge part of my childhood and a lot of nostalgia. If you guys did enjoy this series, please do drop a like. And um, even though today is the final part here, a few days from now, I'll upload a kind of nostalgia video. I don't want to spoil what's going to be in that video, but I'm going to be um, showing you guys what was in the film canisters that we've been uh, going through. Because there's a few extra scenes that you can look at um, once you beat the game. So anyways, let's do it. Super Carrier Sabotage here. Right, here's the plan. There should be a huge ventilation system below decks to prevent the build-up of lethal gases. We are gonna find those systems and break them so the fans are always on. Next, we locate the fuel tanks, damage their valves so that they're spraying vapor, and the fans will spread it all through the ship. Finally, we set a demolition charge at the center, and sayonara. Let's go, Griffin, and try not to attract too much attention. Okay, so here we go, the final mission in the game. And uh, it's it's really cool that they made the final mission on a an aircraft carrier. These things, these vents, you have to open these up. Spread the uh, the fuel vapors through the ship, and then and then just ignite it with an explosive. Anyone that likes like um, you know naval warfare a lot, you're gonna uh, you're gonna really like enjoy this mission. Okay, we have some pilots here. Yeah, this is definitely, um, officers' quarters, you know, soldiers typically don't, yeah. Soldiers don't really have housing like this. This is definitely officers' quarters. Make sure we didn't miss any doors here, too. Okay, yeah. And there's, it's really easy to miss a valve in this mission, too, because there's so many valves to turn. But I think that Japan and America were really the only two countries that used aircraft carriers during World War II. I could be wrong on that, but, um, turn this vent here, okay. Yeah, so this is where the regular soldiers sleep, so you see it's not as fancy as the, um, as the, uh, with the officers. Ooh. Okay, here we go. This is what I'm talking about now. Type 99, okay. destroy them now. See that? Yeah. Nice, right? Oh no, not the crazy chefs. The sushi, the sushi is raw. <laughs> well, a lot of sushi is raw, technically, isn't it?
Ah, great. Ooh. Okay, open this vent here. There we go, another vent. So this is the regular mess hall. And in here was where the officers eat, so you see it's much more fancy. So there was a lot of dislike between the, the Japanese Navy and the Japanese Army. The, the Navy were mostly like, and most of the people that like, um, oh, this is fish. Most of the people that uh, ran the Imperial Japanese Navy were like old school Japanese aristocrats, much older men. Uh, in the army, they tended to be aristocrats too, but um, uh, the army was mostly a lot of working class people, where in the navy, the upper people in the navy were mostly like um, aristocrats, very rich. There's a lot of like, um, a lot of like class warfare specifically in this class conflict. It was ultimately about that. It's ultimately like um, uh, you had some rich elites that were in the Imperial Japanese Navy, and they looked down on the army. And the army, at the same time, kind of did look down on the navy. The army believed that the navy's only job was to transport them to each um, uh, to each location. Okay, didn't miss a vent here. Also, this Japanese machine gun that I'm using was actually a, um, a copy off of the British machine gun, the Bren. I think that, yeah, I think it was the Bren, that was what it was called. You notice how similar it looks? Zero, that looks like it. Several other battleships and carriers. So Japan and America were really the only two countries during World War II that used aircraft carriers. Japan understood that aircraft carriers were going to be the future of warfare, and that's actually what they used aircraft carriers for to attack Pearl Harbor. That's how the planes got that far. They wouldn't have been able to get that far normally. And Japan also did not have the industry that America did, so when, Jap when if America lost an aircraft carrier, it would be really bad. But if Japan lost an aircraft carrier, it would be much worse for them. So, like, imagine, like, just how complicated this must be to, like, make a, a ship like this. soundtrack. Okay. Here we go, another vent. We'll blow up the ship, it's gonna be good. Japan, you could argue, might have had the strongest navy during World War II. There, you know, there, a lot of people say the Japanese army technology wasn't the greatest, like their tanks and their machine guns, sure, but their navy was really good and their air force was good as well. Break these fuel valves. Break it. Okay. Before aircraft carriers were developed, um, 
they uh, armies did experiment with like trying to have aircraft take off from ships like during world war one there was a few like battleships that were able to carry like a one or two seaplanes and then there was actually some airships like big blimps uh the door is locked fuel monitor is not destroyed uh fuel monitor is not destroyed hmm, what did i miss here Destroy fuel monitors. Um, there had a few blimps that were able to hold like they were able to hold like one or two of uh, one or two planes. Oh, that is that what I'm supposed to destroy? Okay. The reason the aircraft carriers were so significant is because you could take like dozens of planes on these aircraft carriers, move them hundreds of miles, and then have those planes attack islands. There we go. Oh, that's, no, it's, oh, ally. Okay. Japanese uh, Navy officers can really take a lot. Gas mask in here. I found the gold at least. You have caused me a great deal of pain, but this is nothing compared to the torture you are about to encounter. Your meddlesome irritations have cost me a fortune in gold. You may have won the battle, but I assure you. One day, the war will come back to haunt you, and Japan will rise again! There is something very familiar about you, Yankee scum. Oh, it's is Tanaka, it right? I remember him. you have a brother? Nothing to say? Then I shall pay a visit to my other American prisoner, and see if his tongue is as resistant as yours. Only I will not be as gracious a host as you have seen here today. Yeah, so Tanaka unfortunately does not make it in this part. Remember, he sacrificed himself to save you. Right, get up to the bridge. I'll arrange some transport below. Make me on a flight deck. Make sure to save right here too. Um, saving just to make sure we don't die and mess up here, but. So Tanaka um, uh, was one of the best written Medal of Honor characters because it shows you that there's plenty of Japanese Americans that fought during the war on the U.S.'s side and were very heroic. But unfortunately at this time the U.S. government had put a lot of Japanese Americans in internment camps. Okay, we're gonna get some revenge here now. And you can just destroy the Zeros with the, um, the Zeros don't have very, very little to no armor.
I think, and I also, in this level, I think you actually see what the Japanese have Type 100, but, but the Type 100 doesn't actually, um, uh, make, an, doesn't actually let you use this in this mission. Man, there's so many people. around here. Here we go, search for some more supplies now. Perfect LMG box. Yeah, we really did a mess on this hangar. Let's go up, up a deck now. Imperial orders, okay. Open hangar. your brother that's up there. Forgot about that part that, that he does show that he has your brother.
sucks we don't have any grenades on this mission. Damn, I really need some more health. There we go. Oh. Okay, the command deck. Search this place. Uh, oh, more documents. Okay, more imper imperial orders found. Okay. False radio transmission, okay, do it. False coordinates sent, okay. Here we go, all Imperial orders found. And final film reel, we got it. Okay. There we go. Now all that's left is to sink the carrier. Weird how they have a Lewis gun on the back here, but
Oh, this is the best part now. should ignite any moment now. and stolen gold swallowed by the sea and a good man gone with it. Fare thee well, Private Tanaka. You were one of the good ones, lad. Well, Griffin, we need to find out where Shima's taken your brother. It's up to you and me, mate. We got a bit of a debt to repay. So for people wondering, yes, Shima escaped with your brother, and, um, and, uh, General Shima, out of all the Medal of Honor games, General Shima is the only Medal of Honor antagonist that survives. The only one. I used to make a lot of really good World War II games back in the day, and it's the music in these games are just so great. And it's I'm I'm very grateful to um uh I'm I'm very grateful to uh developers for making for making a Pacific game because a lot of um a lot of World War II games are not set during the Pacific, they're set in the European theater. But we had gotten a Pacific game. soundtrack is beautiful but yeah this game was just a huge part of my childhood I played this game a lot you know what me and my friends um used to do we used to play co-op on this game because this game had two-player co-op and uh, you know we just hang out Fridays and we just play this game together it's a lot of fun every mission you could do two-player except the Pearl Harbor mission and the um uh, and the super carrier mission but other than that every other mission you could actually do two-player which was actually really cool and so this is actually one of the first few games that actually had co-op campaign at the time. This game's approaching 20 years. No, this November, it'll be 20 years old. Oh, wow, look at that there. Move camera over here. This is the modern military. Hope you guys did like my marine cosplay. This what I've been wearing is what the marines would typically wear in the Pacific theater of the war.
Gonna look real battleships, uh... Move the camera over here. So that's basically when they were, um... I think that's Hawaii right there. Pearl Harbor. And so that's when they were, when they were making the game, they researched the environments. Oh, uh, the USS Arizona. Yeah, this is Hawaii. So they had military advisors that helped them out with this game, too. I'm glad they showed the real-life footage of Hawaii here. Oh, that's the Imperial Japanese Army right there. That has to be a reenactment, though. Yeah, this looks like a reenactment. Um, that's a Type 99 machine gun. Those are accurate uniforms to what the Imperial Japanese Army would wear. Oh, look. The bridge and the river Kwai, in real life. This, has a, this is a very interesting credits scene. I usually, usually I skip the credits on my playthroughs, but this I want to watch to the very end. Yeah. You see those cross the the tracks that aren't finished in this part. You see the crosses there. The um that's for all the victims that died um in the uh, Burma railway. Over a hundred thousand Southeast Asian civilians under forced labor died building that railway, and um over twelve thousand Allied prisoners of war died on it too. It's the Burma Nick railway is nicknamed the Death Railway. Oh, Steven Spielberg helped with this game, too. I didn't know that. He later went on to make the Pacific. Special thanks to all the families and loved ones for their dedication and support in making this project possible. Oh. Medal of Honor Rising Sun team would like to offer their deepest appre appreciation to the veterans of World War II. Only due to your relentless courage and sacrifices, our freedom stands strong today. That's beautiful. And thank you. And so these, these, you know, these, the World War II veterans, these are our real heroes today. I don't know why kids look up to these celebrities so much. I would much rather spend the day talking to a World War II veteran than any kind of celebrity, any day. In 1944, two years after General MacArthur had been ordered to leave 70,000 of his troops stranded, the United States would return to the Philippines. The road back to save MacArthur's men was not easy. Admiral Nimitz's overall attack plan involved a direct route to Japan. No, you can't do that. You can't leave the all the prisoners altogether. in the Philippines. So MacArthur got really mad about that. Chiefs ...and eventually gained their support. In October 1944, MacArthur landed on the island of Leyte, declaring, people of the Philippines, I have returned. MacArthur proceeded to regain control of the Philippines. 
However, less than a third of the troops he had left behind were rescued. See, that's that's how bad the Japanese um uh that's how bad the Japanese prisoner conditions were. Only a third of the soldiers had actually survived Japanese captivity. That's how bad it was. And um, uh, so you see there at the start is that the U.S. the U.S. government's original plan was to actually skip over the Philippines and go straight to Japan. Which no, you can't you can't leave those men behind that were taken prisoner in the Philippines. MacArthur promised that he'd return, and so that's why MacArthur got really mad about that. But he did uh, he did get permission to land the Philippines again, and he came back to the Philippines and he did help to liberate it. And letters from home here. This is the final letter. Dear Joe. Yesterday, Ray Parrish came by to visit. He brought one of those little records that you make in the booth to mail home. One night at the base on Wake Island, after a couple of beers, Ray and Donnie had made a recording as a joke. Ray had forgotten about it and just found it among his things. He played it for us. They sang Home on the Range, and Donnie was off-key as usual. Then there was a message at the end, where Donnie says how much he misses all of us. As you can imagine, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Joe, I know you don't believe in such things. That's your brother. Donnie's voice was like a sign to me. It just made me believe even more that he's out there somewhere and that he's all right. Love from all of us, Mary. Yeah, that's sad. Now, so for, for people wondering what happens to your brother, there was supposed to be a Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2 to this game, but the Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2 got cancelled. The reason it got cancelled is because the sales on this game weren't what EA was expecting, so EA, of course, being the scummy studio that they are, didn't allow Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2, which Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2 would have been a masterpiece. If they took this and just expanded on everything that this had, Rising Sun 2 would have been a great game. We did get a Pacific Assault, which is another, you know, Pacific Medal of Honor game eventually, but I really would have loved to see Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2. You know, we should have gotten that game. And, and we do know a little bit about Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2. We know that the, the story in Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2 is you're actually supposed to play as Donnie in 1944. So it was because this is, you know, still the, a war, the war still got a year to go. And so you were going to be actually playing as Donnie when he actually escaped from the Japanese prisoner of war camp. That was going to be the story in the um, uh, in the Medal of Honor Rising Sun 2. And you, you were eventually going to kill General Shima. But um, General Shima survived. You never kill him. And um, uh, he is the only Medal of Honor antagonist that survives. That is not killed by the main character. That's um, that's that there. But um, yeah, I like I said that, um, you know, I don't I don't cry in a lot of games. I don't, you know, there really hasn't ever been any kind of video game that's made me cry, but the closest that I've ever been to crying is, like, in these World War II games, uh, because of just the, the heroic sacrifice that these brave men had gone through, you know, to fight for our freedom and to, you know, defeat, you know, Nazi Germany, to defeat Imperial Japan. You know, these, these guys went through a lot. They did. And the thing is, though, is that it just hurts me so much that there's just so many people that don't appreciate them today like you see so many world war ii veterans that are just so old today they're struggling and people just don't care and it just it just breaks my heart about that it's just horrible uh, it's just uh, yeah i remember there was a world war ii veteran that i talked to once i did mention this earlier in my playthrough who he told me that he was a pilot um I, he didn't specify whether he was a bomber or a fighter pilot um so i i don't i don't know that but he, um, he told me that the thing that scared him the most wasn't even dying. He said what scared him the most was, was getting shot down and getting captured by the Japanese. He said that he'd rather kill himself than get captured by the Japanese. That's how much the soldiers were scared of Japanese captivity and how cruel the Japanese were, the prisoners. But, um, yeah, these guys, you know, fought on and, you know, we have, we owed them a lot. And the thing is, though, is me personally being like a, um, uh, really into history, in my personal opinion, out of all the countries that the U.S. has ever fought in its history, other than at the found founding with the British and the Revolutionary War, I would say the toughest enemy that the U.S. has ever fought in its history would be Imperial Japan. I would say that. Now, some people might say, don't you think that Germany was a tougher opponent? The thing is, though, is that Germany might have had superior technology to Japan. They did. They had, you know, much better machine guns, tanks, um, uh, you know, planes to a degree. But the thing about that is that even though Germany had six better technology, 
the conditions of the Pacific were just so much more brutal than the Western Front and like France 1944. France 1944 was really bad too, don't get me wrong, like, you know, you had a D-Day, the Normandy landings, but the point that I'm getting at is the Pacific, you have these like really tropical jungles, very close quarter fighting, very hot, you know, and you had like an enemy that would just fight on to the very end. And that's what's so scary. That's why I say that Japan is the toughest enemy that the U.S. has ever fought in its history. Tougher than, the, um, uh, tough, I personally think they were a tougher enemy than Germany, and I think they're a tougher enemy than the Viet Cong also. Um, the reason for that was because the Japanese fought on to the very end. If you look at, like, for example, like, Europe, at, like, at, in 1945, for example, you know, you go into, like, late 1944, you know, early 1945, a lot of Germans at that point had realized that the war's up. They realized they're gonna lose. And so the Germans started surrendering in mass. Um, they did. The Germans that, that fought on to the very end were the ones that were the most brainwashed by the Nazi regime, the most fanatical. Typically, this was the Nazi SS that would fight on to the very end. But if you look at the amount of prisoners that the U.S. took near the end of the war, like, a lot of Germans were surrendering, like, in mass near the end of the war. However, that was not the case with the Japanese. The Japanese would fight on to the very end. If the Germans realized they were going to lose the battle, they would oftentimes surrender. But the Japanese, they fought on to the very end. If you look at the islands campaign that we fought on in, you had like, um, you know, Okinawa, you had Iwo Jima, you had, um, uh, you had Guad Guadalcanal, the Solomon Islands. Like, you had, um, you had so many island campaigns. And in these island campaigns, the U.S. literally killed like 90%. 90 to 95 percent of all the Japanese soldiers on these islands and the reason that the Japanese casualties were so high is because the Japanese would just not surrender they would just fight on till the very end where if you look at the European battles the European battles oftentimes it was at most where we would take out like 70 percent of the enemy in a battle 20 percent would maybe like surrender and then we had like 10 percent that would retreat and run away so it was like around there but you know in the Pacific the amount of enemies that we killed percentage wise was much greater than like percentage wise the amount that we had that we had of access access forces that would surrender to the European theater. The reason that the Japanese actually fought on to the very end was because of Bush Bushido, which was the code of the samurai. And the Japanese basically believe that the samurai fights to the very end. The warrior fights to the very end, the warrior does not give up. And in the Japanese also saw their emperor as a god. In their form of Shintoism that they practiced, the emperor was a god, and they believed that they, if they fought honorably for the emperor and they died for the emperor, they would be united with nature. That's generally what the Shinto religion believes. And so that's why the Japanese would fight on to the very end. They their emperor is a god and they were not going to let their god down they were going to fight on to the very end that's why japan actually when we landed in japan that's actually the reason that we did not have that much resistance when the M after the atomic bombings when the emperor told his people to stand down he didn't tell them to surrender but he told them to stand down specifically he didn't use the word surrender for shame but it was uh, when he told the Japanese public to stand down, the Japanese public largely stood down. That's why the emperor wasn't tried. A lot of people, a lot of people on my live streams ask me, why was the emperor not put on trial? The reason the emperor wasn't put on trial is because if the U.S. Cap put the emperor on trial and hanged him, we would have had never-ending civil war, never-ending um, unrest in Japan. Japan at this time was like North Korea today. They were very brainwashed. They saw their leader as a god, and they were going to fight on to the very end for their leader. They were not going to uh, surrender. In their culture, they saw surrender as worse than death. That was the worst shame that you could have is when you could surrender to the to the enemy. And that's one of the reasons they treated pr prisoners of war so badly, because they thought that they were cowards if they had surrendered. And that's the Japanese, that's one of the reasons the Japanese were just so cruel. But that's, I'm going to talk more about this in my next part, guys. So thank you guys for watching. I had a lot of fun on this part. I hope you guys like when I talk history in these parts. I do like history a lot, like reading it a lot. And, you know, this game like this holds a special place in my heart. And, you know, I want to thank all the World War II veterans that had fought on and, like, you know, you know, protected us and, like, helped rid the world of Nazism, fascism, and stop Imperial Japan as well. So thank you, thank you to everybody who, who watched this, and thank you to all the World War II veterans who fought for our freedom. I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day, guys.